Growing up in foster care, I always yearned for the simplicity of an ordinary family. Familiar with the feeling of solitude in the world, I had foster parents, but no blood ties. What I truly longed for was a family of my own. The perfect family, with a loving husband, adorable children, and me. So, when a kind-hearted man proposed to me, I was overjoyed. With him, I thought I could finally build that ordinary family I'd always dreamed of. However, in believing so, I was the world's biggest fool. My husband, Harrison, callously ordered me around after my long days at work. Lila, make dinner now. Mom and Nellie are starving, he'd say, barely two seconds after I walked in the door. Harrison, my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, none of them ever thought of cooking. My name is Lila, and I'm 29 years old. Recently, I found myself stuck with this terrible family. I worked for a large corporation where Harrison was also employed. We met at the same company. Harrison was 30 years old, but since he couldn't get into college right after graduating high school, we ended up graduating college at the same time. First of all, it's important to mention that Harrison was currently unemployed. He had a dispute with his boss in the sales department and quit his job. Harrison was angry, claiming his boss was cold-hearted, but I knew otherwise. Even though Harrison and I were married, we worked in different departments of the same company. I worked in the general affairs department, handling office work. My dedication and hard work were trusted and respected by my colleagues. During this time, the sales department manager Percival, where Harrison worked, came to me for advice. Nervously, I asked him what the matter was. He tiredly opened his mouth and explained that Harrison had suddenly handed in his resignation that day. Shocked and confused, I had no idea this was happening. The manager explained the situation to me. Harrison would casually leave work even if his tasks weren't finished, and he'd dump his overtime work on his colleagues. When confronted, he would lash out in anger, claiming that we shared housework since we both worked. He also insisted on leaving work on time, citing concerns for his mother and sister's well-being. Feeling guilty and embarrassed, I apologized profusely to the manager. However, he reassured me that it wasn't my fault. He expressed his disgust for Harrison, who quit his job without consulting me, his wife. Harrison believed he would quickly find a new job, but the reality was harsh. Despite his efforts in job hunting, he faced rejection after rejection. He resented his previous boss, convinced that he had sabotaged his chances with other companies. I can swear that my company does not engage in such practices. Even after submitting a resignation, it's common knowledge among working people to stay in the company for at least a month. There are matters like work handover and procedures to be dealt with. However, Harrison slammed his resignation letter onto the manager's desk and went home the same day. It was obvious to me that such an unreasonable person would not be hired by any company. Harrison was content with giving his small severance paid to his mother and sister. He was raised in a single-parent family with his mother and sister, Nellie. Their father divorced his mother and left, which seems to have been a wise decision. Both my mother-in-law and Nellie are healthy and capable of working, but they do nothing. I pay for living expenses and do all the work. Whenever I asked Harrison to help out at home, he yelled at me, saying, My mother and Nellie are my precious family, girl. You should be devoted to helping us out. It made no sense to me, so I snapped back at him. Forget about your mother, but Nellie is 23 years old. At least let her get a part-time job. Harrison adored Nellie a lot, who was seven years younger than him. Nellie was also taking advantage of Harrison's kindness, pleading for pocket money. As I firmly refused to give her money, Harrison started working part-time. It was a job managing a warehouse for a career service. Harrison told people around him that he quit his job at the major corporation because his family was sick. He is a man who lies as he breathes, just to keep his reputation. And so Harrison's part-time earnings became Nellie's dating expenses. Not doing any housework or work, Nellie started going out with men. I was fed up with my mother-in-law stealing bills from my wallet out of her greed for money. Even if I talked to Harrison about it, he would get mad at me, saying, Take care of my mom if you're my wife. This is why I can't stand people who grew up all alone in foster care like you. My mother-in-law scoffed at me, calling me wicked. I was living my days with the worst family. But one day, 
an encounter that changed my depressing daily life arrived. When I came home after buying groceries after work, there were unfamiliar shoes at the entrance, large-sized men's sneakers. I thought we had a guest over since the shoes were larger than Harrison's. Then, a young man popped out. He was tall, had a handsome face, and his hair was light brown. When I thought Nellie had brought her boyfriend, the man apologized, saying, I'm sorry, I was in the words of dating Nellie, but I'll take it back. Contrary to his frivolous appearance, his tone was polite, a wise young man making sound judgments. Enjoying the story so far? Show your support by liking and subscribing to our channel. Now let's dive back into the story. I spontaneously asked the young man who was about to leave with his sneakers on, What's your name? I'm Nellie's sister-in-law, Lila. I introduced myself. The young man looked up and smiled a little. He looked like a player, but he had a smart expression. After he finished putting on his sneakers, he introduced himself. I'm James. I work as a bartender. According to him, Nellie confessed to him, and he was about to accept, but he declined. The reason was that Nellie showed her true nature and spilled everything because of alcohol. All my money is from Harrison's part-time job. My sister-in-law is stingy and ugly. She makes me work and do housework, Nellie had confided. James deeply regretted that he was inexperienced and couldn't spot a good woman because of that. But he's a kind-hearted person who couldn't leave drunk Nellie alone and sent her home. Moreover, James paid for the taxi fare. Just at such times, both Harrison and my mother-in-law were not at home. So James got our house key from Nellie, who was wasted and carried her to our living room. I couldn't just leave her at the entrance. I swear I didn't steal anything, ma'am, he pleaded. He seemed to be studying at a vocational school during the day and working as an apprentice bartender at night. Nellie had called him out after school, claiming to work at a clothing store. James didn't see through Nellie's lies until the last moment. Despite his splashy light brown hair, he was a serious and sincere young man. His natural hair color, a mix, matched the flashy appearance. This is the business card for the bar I work at. Sorry for the trouble. It's running late, but he said he's ready to work now he explained. Thank you for bringing Nellie home. Have a great shift, I replied, smiling as James left. Normally, I would report a young man who was at home without permission and had a connection with Nellie, but I intuitively thought that James was a trustworthy person with a good nature. It was a silver lining that he hadn't been deceived by Nellie. When I entered the living room, Nellie was indeed drunk and asleep. Annoyance aside, to avoid dealing with a potential cold, I covered her with a blanket. Suddenly, Nellie woke up and opened her mouth, unable to pronounce her words exactly. Hey, where's James? My boyfriend with the brown hair. So handsome, she mumbled, checking her phone. James had verbally told her he couldn't date her, but it was in vain. Nellie was too drunk to understand James's intentions. Cleverly, James had politely declined through a text. Nellie had no recollection of revealing her true nature, she cried and grew angry, feeling like James had abandoned her. What's wrong with me? I've been deceived, Nellie wailed, oblivious to her deception. Ignoring the commotion, I started cooking dinner. When Harrison and my mother-in-law came home and heard Nellie's side of the story, Harrison became furious. Did he mess with you, Nellie? Where does he work? I'll punch him for you. We're going to demand damages. Indeed, poor Nellie was foolish and pitiful completely due to her resentment. As I worried about causing trouble for James, Nellie glared at me. Anna, did you say something to James? She demanded, showing me the text on her phone. The message read, I can't date a liar. Nellie had drunkenly revealed everything, but thought I was the one who tattled. Harrison and my mother-in-law also confronted me, so I explained the truth of my encounter with James at the entrance. He was trying to take care of Nellie and was about to leave the house when we ran into each other. That's all, I asserted, making it clear that I hadn't said anything unnecessary to him. Harrison clicked his tongue and turned his face away from me. Nellie, let's eat sushi today. It's premium sushi, he declared, deciding to order sushi delivery on his own and indulging with my mother-in-law and Nellie all on my tab, without touching any of the dinner. As I sat alone eating the dinner I had prepared, the laughter of the three of them echoed through the house. Eating sushi as a family is the best. It makes up for the usually terrible cooking, Harrison remarked between bites. It's so delicious. It compensates for the usual bad food, 
my mother-in-law chimed in, joining the laughter. Agreeing with them, Harrison laughed along, enduring their mockery. But amidst their joviality, I felt an overwhelming sense of emptiness. Is this the family I had yearned for when I got married? How foolish. I had been suddenly faced with the memory of my only family member with whom I had become estranged after marriage. For some reason, my adopted father's image floated in my mind. Several days later, a turning point arrived while I was cleaning the house on my day off. Harrison brought me a bank book showing the deposit notification. Panic surged within me. The bank book recorded the savings I had carefully accumulated before our marriage. With a triumphant look, Harrison handed me the cash card. I'm giving the $100,000 you saved to my parents and sister. If you refuse, we divorce, he declared. This was the money I had been saving for our future child's expenses. I had hoped that having a child would change things, that Harrison might distance himself from his mother and Nellie. But Harrison crushed those dreams, saying, I care about my mother and sister more than our kid. Do as you like. Realizing that building a happy and ordinary family with Harrison was impossible, I showed him the divorce papers I had prepared. If you accept this, we're getting a divorce. It's over between us, I stated firmly. With joy, Harrison filled in the necessary information on the divorce papers and handed them back, ignoring his elation over the $100,000. I packed my bags and left the house, submitting the divorce papers, which got registered without a hitch. Returning to my adopted father's house, I called him. Lila, come back to your family home, he said. I, who had rebelled against my adopted father since adolescence, felt tears welling up. Despite our strained relationship, my adopted father forgave me, even though I had been ungrateful. Living quietly at home, memories from my childhood flooded back. I remember being taken from the orphanage to my adopted father's house. At that time, I had an adoptive mother who loved me as if I were her daughter. But she passed away from illness during my junior high school days. I began rebelling against my adopted father. His frequent absences due to work left me feeling lonely. But upon reflection, I realized that both my adoptive father and late adoptive mother had cared for me deeply. Fixated on the idea of a normal family, I had overlooked the love of those closest to me. Now divorced, I felt a huge burden lifted off my shoulders. With this weight off, I threw myself into my work. It was during this time that I ran into James again. As I was leaving work one day, I bumped into the sales department manager in the elevator hall. Good job today, I greeted him, to which he kindly responded. You've been through a lot. You look better than before, and I'm so happy for you. He sincerely praised me for holding up well after my divorce. As I bowed and entered the elevator, the manager's tone turned serious. There's a bar that's been talked about in the sales department, he mentioned. I want to go, but it's a bit too fancy for an old man like me. Despite being married with children in high school, he expressed curiosity about the place. What kind of place is it, a cafe or something? He wondered aloud. He then humbly asked me to accompany him. Knowing the manager's sincerity, I agreed to accompany him to the bar. The bar recommended by the manager's colleagues turned out to be a hidden gem in the basement. Don't be nervous, the manager reassured me as he opened the door to the shop. Inside, the decor was chic, appealing to younger crowds. But what shocked me was when I looked at the bar counter and saw James, the bartender I had encountered before my divorce. He seemed a bit surprised, but quickly greeted me with a smile. Welcome. It's been a long time, Lila, he said. The manager, noticing their interaction, raised his voice. Do you know each other? The women in my department have been talking about a very handsome man working here. He looks like an actor, he chuckled. James, however, downplayed it. Not at all. I'm just an apprentice bartender. What would you like to order? As I was not accustomed to bars, I let James recommend a drink for me. Meanwhile, the manager opted for a non-alcoholic cocktail. The atmosphere was serene and the clientele was refined. During our conversation, James mentioned that his father was the owner of the bar. Despite my initial rebellion and college pursuits, I found myself inspired by my father's line of work. As we sipped our drinks, I mentioned my recent divorce. The boss, unusually furious, commented, That woman's ex-husband is outrageous. 
I shouldn't have given him a retirement allowance, muttered the boss. But did you get drunk on a non-alcoholic drink James prepared a mint? Smiling at me as I forced a smile, he offered the Minnesota to the boss for free. The boss calmed down a bit and while drinking Minnesota asked, Hey mister, do you send drinks from other customers like in dramas? James laughed cheerfully at the boss's serious question. Ah, I've never done it. Urban legend, perhaps. Amidst the pleasant atmosphere at the bar, my phone suddenly rang. I was about to step outside, but James assured me it was okay to answer the call here. Upon confirming it was Harrison, my ex-husband whom I had divorced, I was annoyed by the interruption of the fun gathering, but I answered due to the persistent calls. Before I could inquire about the purpose of the call, Harrison complained loudly, I can't withdraw money. Your balance is zero. Of course, that's after I transferred the deposit to another account. Would anyone keep a passbook with a $100,000 deposit in a house where those three greedy people live? I retorted. The passbook Harrison stole from me was a dummy. The real one was carefully hidden by me. That's how I still had the $100,000. When I informed him, Harrison was dumbfounded. Meanwhile, my former mother-in-law and Nellie were overseas, living luxuriously. They gambled, and as their funds started to run out, they attempted to dip into my $100,000. However, they couldn't withdraw the money and were distressed enough to call me. Harrison threatened me to send all my assets immediately. I refused and handed over the dummy passbook obediently. I also relinquished the house in the property division, boldly declaring that I no longer knew anything about it. Meanwhile, James asked me to lend him my phone in front of me and the boss. He ruthlessly demanded, Harrison, there is a tab of $3,000 for your sister's drinks. I'm sorry, but please pay. After saying only that, James returned my phone to me. So work hard for your beloved mother and sister, big brother, I said as Harrison cried for help. But I hung up the call, apologizing for the fuss. James offered me a cocktail with a smile. It's on me, Andrew. Ginger ale for the boss. Let's toast to the refreshing turn of events. James, the boss, and I toasted to Harrison's miserable fate. From then on, Harrison truly fell into a hell of debt. When he was at a loss in a hotel overseas, a kind gentleman approached him. The gentleman, a precedent in finance, offered to lend him money. If Harrison was in trouble, Harrison, not direly in need of money, jumped at it without considering the interest. As a result, his debt ballooned to $500,000 and he was in a crisis. The kind gentleman even prepared a job for him to repay the loan. Now it seems Harrison is working on a fishing boat and nobody knows where he is. Nellie and my mother-in-law had an obligation to repay. Working from morning till night, except for sleeping, they sold their house and now live in a small apartment. I was going about my usual routine at my parents' home when, unusually, my foster father was also present. As we chatted, he remarked, You're well prepared, pitching my ex-husband to the deep end, referring to the individual who lent money to Harrison, effectively sending him into a financial trap. My foster father was a prominent figure in the financial industry, well-connected in various fields. Harrison was on a family trip abroad with the proceeds from selling all of my jewelry, which he couldn't have afforded with just his part-time job salary. When I got married, my foster father had instructed me to safeguard two things, the jewelry and the house. I'm always amazed at your audacity, Dad, I quipped. My foster father had connections with the precious metal buyer that Harrison utilized. He knew that Harrison, who sold my jewelry, was going overseas. You show up just in time in front of Harrison, and you see through everything, I remarked, astounded by his foresight. Laughing, he mentioned that he also knew about my rapport with the young bartender. I nearly spat out my tea. I chuckled. The manager took a liking to James, so he brought other colleagues along to the bar. That's when my boss asked James, Do you have someone you're interested in here? Be honest. Directed by my manager's leading question. James looked at me and confessed, I like you, Lila. If you're okay with someone as inexperienced as me, let's get together. Stunned, I reminded him of our age difference and my divorce. But James persisted, expressing his feelings earnestly. In an unexpected turn of events, I found myself with a 23-year-old boyfriend. My manager was overjoyed, declaring himself my wingman. 
I intended to tell my foster father about James later, but he found out when I mentioned visiting James's bar. He's a very nice young man, my foster father remarked, contrasting him with Harrison. My foster father had always been fiercely protective of me, and though he could be extreme, he was a kind father. I felt grateful to have him in my life. When I shared my plans to start a new family with James, he smiled and congratulated me. Next time, I plan to take a break and go to the hot springs with my dear foster father, with James joining us. I promised to marry James, and I could already envision a harmonious family dynamic between my father and James. With a smile, I reported my plans to my father, who returned the sentiment with warm congratulations. Congratulations, Lila, he said, sealing the approval for my new journey ahead. Let's conclude the story briefly once again. After enduring a tumultuous marriage and discovering the true nature of my ex-husband and his family, I found solace in the support of my foster father and the unexpected love of James, a kind-hearted bartender. With their encouragement, I embarked on a new chapter of my life, leaving behind the burdens of the past and embracing the promise of a harmonious future. As I look ahead to marrying James and building a family filled with love and understanding, I am grateful for the lessons learned and the strength gained from overcoming adversity. Thanks for watching. How did you find the story? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more awesome stories like this. Your feedback and support mean a lot.